Hi, in this video I'm going to explain some details of my design of three-phase motor driver. Before we start I would recommend you to grab some energy drink or make sure you can fall asleep at any moment. So what we will be doing here? I will go through schematic, some data sheets, layout design and software. Basically I will try to explain the function and selection of each component there. Just for the record, I'm using this at 12 volts and up to 20 amps, but in theory, selection of MOSFET will determine maximum supply voltage and output current. Okay, so let's look at the schematic. Well, there's really nothing special there, maybe the optocouplers, but basically this is the notebook example circuit. But it took me some time to get there. So you can see that there are three identical parts, and these are the phase drivers. This contraption down there is just to enable the optocouplers. My optocouplers are inverting the output signal, so this means that if you turn this thing on, all MOSFETs are basically open, so it can destroy your MOSFETs and your power supply. So if the optocouplers are disabled, the MOSFETs are disabled also. And these guys are just hole sensors. Okay, so let's have a closer look at the phase driver. So here we have two optocouplers. These are providing isolated signal for high side and low side MOSFETs. This is high side and low side MOSFET driver. It's using bootstrapping to provide the high side MOSFET voltage that it requires. On the output stage we have two MOSFETs and that is connected directly to the motor coil. So let's take a step back and have a closer look. These two terminals are the microcontroller input. You are supposed to feed the optocouplers with complementary PWM signal. To reduce the audible noise from the motor I am running this at 50 kHz. Now grab a calculator and do a little math. 50 kHz corresponds to about 20 microseconds interval. Now divide that by 8-bit resolution of the timer, that is 255, and we get the length of the shortest pulse, that is about 80 nanoseconds. Now this is starting to get a little bit challenging there. Ok, so let's keep in mind these numbers and let's dive into the datasheet of this optocoupler. Ok, so we are looking for ideally 12V supply voltage, just later on I found out that this can handle only 5V, but it seems that it is working at 12 Here it says 15 megabout. that's I guess 15 megahertz, so that should be ok. Now here's the package of this chip, it's basically a deal package, so it's huge, and this was also a mistake. And the third mistake is the amplified open collector output. This means that it is inverting the signal, which is evident from this truth table. But still we can work around this. Here you can see that this chip is suitable for power transistor isolation in motor drives. Yeah, that's me. Ok, here's some dimensions and mechanical bullshit. Ok, let's take a look at the absolute maximum ratings. Of which we are interested just in collector current to calculate the value of this resistor. Ok, let's look at the next table, which is recommended operating conditions. And you can see there are supply voltage separated in two rows. And I don't know why it's that, probably because it's tested only in that range, whatever. But it's good. We can use 5 volts to power this on. Then here we have high level input current, which we can use to calculate value for this resistor. We also need to know input forward voltage for this, and that's here. And the output plug resistor. Basically, the lower the resistance, the faster the switching. But yeah, 1k will do. Normal people keep thousands of them stocked. Ok, we can take a look at some switching figures, and here we can see... Pulse width distortion, 13 nanoseconds. That's quite ok. Rise time and fall time, 21 and 6.6 .6 nanoseconds. That's usable. Hmm, propagation delay is quite variable there, but it works, so I don't know. Ok, so what's here? Some test circuits, some graphs, well, and nobody gets time for this. We are good there. Ok, so here we have only some bypass caps or nothing really important, and the signal from the optocoupler is fed directly to the MOSFET driver. Ok, so this guy can switch up to 600 volts. Now for us DV over DT is not a really big issue, because we are switching quite the low voltage. But if you want to switch high voltages, you should read something about this problem. 
I will not be covering this problem because it's too complex for this video and there's not one universal solution for this. So I guess that up to some 60 volts there will probably not be any problems with switching, but if there will be some shoot through, that means that both transistors will be open at the same time, you can increase the gate resistance by some very low value, some 5 or 10 ohms and should be okay. Now this is basically the supply voltage, so we are okay here. Under voltage lockout, well, in practice this means that if the voltage across this chip will be greater than 9.8 volts or something like that, it will turn off. Now this may be desirable in some applications, but in low voltage applications not so much. It may happen that the motor will draw too much power from the power source and across the power lines there will be voltage drop. So in my case, when the supply voltage dropped below this threshold, I experienced some squeaky noises from the motor. I was running quite low resistance motor, let's say 1 ohm per phase, with PC power supply and the maximum what I could deliver was about 15 amps, so... So what you can do to improve the performance is keep the wires short and add as much capacitance to the circuit as possible. Ok, let's continue. So we have 5V logic level input, match propagation delay, which is quite useful. You can see that the driving capabilities are not very spectacular, but it's ok. This is propagation delay, which is not very important for us, and delay matching of 50 nanoseconds, which is ok. Blah 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 blah. Here in the absolute maximum ratings, you can see that you can operate this at 25 volts. Which does not mean that you should. 25 volts is beyond the maximum recommended voltage for the MOSFET's gate. So if you want to operate this at voltage higher than 20 volts, you need to provide 12 volts to the MOSFET drivers and Arduino. And this is not a part of my circuit, so be aware of that. Now these figures are pretty much just the detailed version of what we just read. A functional block diagram. And I must say, that the solution that they use for controlling the high voltage side of the circuit is quite clever. What they do is they are using current pulses to control the flip-flop element there. This delay matching is also quite interesting in my opinion, because clearly I don't understand it correctly. Because this should not work with complementary PWM and it does. But whatever. Then there are some graphs and nothing really interesting. Yep. Yeah. But let's return to the typical application circuit. And you can see that there's some diode and some capacitor. So what this does is that when this MOSFET is conducting, this capacitor will charge through this diode. And when you flip the switch, this transistor is not conducting. That means that this terminal is basically floating in the air. And the driver will connect this capacitor from this source to this gate in order to make this transistor conduct because it needs voltage from source to gate to be at least say 10 volts but the question is what capacitor should i use well it depends basically for slow motor like mine is the value of 10 microfarads is quite okay now if you want to use as small value as possible there is some application node somewhere there floating on the internet explaining how to choose value for these parts. But in our case, we know that we will use 10 microfarad capacitor, so the inrush current will not be that extreme, so diode 1N4148 will be probably okay. Okay, so the last critical part is the MOSFET. So I am using this guy. VDS is 40 volts, which is basically maximum supply voltage for the motor. RDS on at 10 volts VGS is 8.7 milliohms. And RDS on is resistance of the transistor when it's turned on, so obviously the lower the better. And the gate charge is 7.6 nanocoulombs, which I cannot imagine what that means in reality. According to these numbers, this can probably deliver some 50-ish amps continuously when cooled properly. Yeah, I mean, this is pretty typical low voltage high current transistor. Also, looking at the body diode characteristic, it's not that terrible diode, actually. 
It's quite good. And I almost forgot, these two transistors there. So one is P-channel, one is N-channel, something with VDS about 10 volts and filter by price. Okay, I hope I covered this somehow. If you want to ask any questions, feel free. And let's do something else. Maybe let's cover how this thing works, actually. Okay, so let's say I want to pass current from coil C to coil A. So, let's assume that Arduino or some other microcontroller is started and it's prepared to do its work. Okay, so let's enable the optocouplers. To do that, we need to set the pin opto enable to high, or 5 volts. This will turn on transistor Q1, so it's conductive. That will pull down gate of transistor Q2, and that will turn it on, or enable, or make it conductive, or whatever. That will connect optocouplers to the 5 volt terminal through this diode D1. This diode is just for protection. Basically, if there's higher voltage anywhere behind this diode, it will not pass back to the Arduino. It's not perfect protection, but it should be more than enough. Okay, optocouplers are enabled and pins A plus to C minus should be at plus 5 volts. This means that all output MOSFETs are turned off. Now, by turning off the C minus terminal, we will turn on Q8 MOSFET. After that, we apply complementary PWM signal to A plus and A minus terminal. The reason for using complementary PWM is that motor is inductive load and we need to have free link path when the MOSFET A plus is turned off. Normally, the MOSFET body diode will provide the free link path, but. As we saw in the datasheet, the body diode forward voltage is about 1 volt. Now, if we are passing, let's say, 10 amps through this body diode, the power dissipation is 10 volts. So to decrease the power loss, we can open the MOSFET. Now the power loss is only about 1 watt. Yeah, I guess that's all to it. And rinse and repeat. Okay, now let's have a look at some board layout, maybe. To build a prototype, I made a single-sided board, which is quite big. And I have to make some modifications because I forgot a few things there. For example, that optocoupler enabling that has been made after I built and tested the board. Also, this board needed quite a lot of jump wires, so the double-sided board will be much better. Okay, so here's the double-sided board, and it's a little bit bigger than Arduino, and it can be directly connected to the Arduino header. At least I think it can, because if you can, uh, if you look at there, there is this yellow rectangle that is, that is Arduino power supply, 12 volts, that big beefy connector there. So I hope this will not be a problem. Also, the transistors are connected in line, so they can be cooled with one heatsink. There are six vias there, and these are here for enabling optocouplers. Everything specced quite a bit here because I'm using 1206 resistors and capacitors. And really these optocouplers are huge. And I haven't even placed any caps there, so that could be a problem. I guess I can remove these power terminals and place some cap there. Yeah. Okay, let's cover software. I'm using Atmel 32U4 Micro in Arduino Leonardo. I don't know about other Arduinos, but this can provide 6 complementary PWM outputs by its hardware. I'm quite sure that it can be implemented in software, but it's quite a lot of work and not very much worth it. Okay, so here are some pin definitions and these are corresponding to the schematic. I mean, almost. AP pin is A positive or A plus, AN is A negative or A minus. These are digital pins and cannot be changed because of hardware limitations. By the way, you can read more about this function at 32U4 datasheet at section 15.8.4. Potpin is potentiometer input. It's set currently to be directly controlling duty cycle of the PWM output. MS1ABC pins are pins for whole sensor input. In setup section, we will set pins to appropriate states. It's good to set opto enable pin as soon as possible to output and to zero. All sensors are open collectors, so you can set these pins to input pull-up and you don't need additional pull-up resistors. Then set AP to C and pin to output. And setting state of these pins to high will disable the output transistors. You don't really have to do this because optocouplers are disabled anyway, so... Next 8 lines are configuration for timer 4. 
After you configure timers and prescalers and things like that, it's good to add some delay and then you can enable the optocouplers. I mean, I'm pretty sure there is some register you can pull to be sure that everything is ready, but I don't know this architecture real well and... Yeah, some 5 milliseconds should be more than enough. I'm using one global variable ms one before to check if the sensor state is changed. Next I will read the state of the whole sensors and populate MS1, then read the potentiometer value. Since the analog to digital converter is 10 bit, I am dividing the value by 3.8. Okay, it's stupid, don't judge me. 4 is simply too much, it doesn't go all the way to 3FF. Also, it doesn't go all the way to 0, so here are some limits for the lowest and highest value. Then after these painful calculations, we apply the duty cycle to the timer 4. So the duty cycle is applied. Now we compare MS1 value to the last known state. And if it's changed, we will call function motor control and change last known state of MS1. Okay, here in motor control function, we have defined some three constants. And these are AP mask through CP mask. This will set which of the outputs will output the complementary PWM signal. If this is set to 0, none of the outputs will output complementary PWM signal, and if this is set to 3F or 6 ones, all of the outputs will output complementary PWM signal. AN, BN and CN will be used for setting the output of AN pin, BN sin, CN pin. We will set them to true, so the output transistors will be disabled, and we will change one of them later. We passed an argument to this function, and this was the state of motor sensors. Now according to this value, we will decide what to do next. If we see all three inputs high, this means that the sensors are disconnected. In that case, we will set all outputs to 1, so the transistors are off, and also set output mask to 0, so this will disconnect all the PWM outputs from the output pins. So now our driver is doing nothing, and the motor is either staying still or freewheeling. In any other valid case, we will set appropriate PWM output mask and set the appropriate negative pin to false or zero. So this will turn on the appropriate transistors. I mean, on the high side, the transistors will be turned on immediately after you set the output mask. To turn on the low side transistor, you will have to do digital write to the pin, which is done there. So here you are basically just modifying the variable which is only in memory. And this is because, I don't know, probably some historic reasons, well... Now, this program just turns with the motor. It does not do anything else. Nevertheless, it's good starting point. You can modify this to do, I don't know, constant frequency. That is quite cool. And if you are feeling brave, you can throw out this PWM6 setup and modify this to drive even the asynchronous motors. Okay, so here is some footage using this driver. Here you can see this contraption, this is enabled for optocouplers. So you can see I can crank up current to 10 amps for a short period of time and currents are still cool. I mean it can withstand such current for say a minute or two. But to be honest it's quite scary to see this turning so fast. And what's pretty cool is that I can turn this down to some 100 milliamps and it's still going. Apparently you can power this with AAA battery. Okay, so I guess that's everything what I wanted to say and yeah, see you soon.